Hi, and welcome to a flip through and review of the Oracle of the Mythic Heroes created by Latao Wang. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. They reached out to me via email uh, to ask if I wanted to review this deck. And I had recently become obsessed with the Mythis, Mythos Tarot. Sorry, I do have a review of that up as well. So I thought, you know what? I am all in the myths and the, well, I shouldn't call it myths, like the Greek pantheon, if you will. I have already worked with this deck because, of course, this is a review and not a first impressions. So, yeah, this is what you get in a box. Look at the guidebook. <laughs> you get a lot it is over 200 pages it's over 250 pages and we're definitely gonna dive into this thing because i think it really adds something to the value of the deck and then here we have the cards we have 40 cards the box oh, does not want to give me this lost card here okay i got it this is what the back looks like you won't find zeus zeus how do you say it in english athena or poseidon within but humans who are often overlooked from myths from the adventurer Aeneas and the prideful Icarus to the huntress at Atalanta and the musician Orpheus. So I think that that is really cool because it's not just the gods and goddesses who have um, something to share with us, who have a story to tell or that it can be told. So I think that is really, really cool. The link to buy this will be in the description box below. Any Amazon links are always affiliated. I hope the flickering of the candle isn't too obnoxious. Um, I'll find out in editing. So what I find with this with these cards here, we're definitely going to do like an entire walkthrough, but just a quick glance here is that when you look at this card, you think, oh, this is going to be a really dark, dark themed deck, but you also have um, a lot of cards with more light in them. So that is something that is important to me because I do a lot of my readings at the end of the afternoon or in the evening. So it's very important for me that I actually can see uh, what is on my cards. So what I really like about this deck is that we have, first of all, the name of the person. I also like that we have a little astrology symbol here. We're going to dive into the uh, guidebook to see how deeply that is explained. And then we have a keyboard. I say this often, but I really appreciate an Oracle deck uh, when it has a theme like this, that we have a keyword on it because I cannot, for the life of me, remember the stories of all these people and I don't want to have to read the story of this person before I can interpret the card um, in a reading. So yeah, that is what I really appreciate. So let's flip through the deck. This deck, mm, I think it's a little bit bigger than standard Oracle size. And I like that we see them, uh, a lot of them we see in action. So it's not just with, with like the Mythos Tarot, where it's just portraits of all the gods and goddesses. Uh, but here we um, mostly see them in action or we see something that really represents the keyword. So here we have sensuality. I like that we have uh, Taurus here as well with this um, with this card. And it does represent sensuality, I think, well enough. And we also have some other things in the card, some symbols, some scenes that we can draw from in our reading as well. And I think that is especially good for when you read with this deck next to another tarot deck so you can sort of use symbols in this deck and connect them to the card meanings or even symbols in the tarot deck that you're using i think this is a very interesting keyword here we have greed for midas and we're definitely like i said gonna dive into the guidebook as well to see how midas's story uh, has to do with greed because i do know everything he touches turns into gold but it <laughs> I, I think I remember something about maybe it being good, um, all well and done in the beginning, but then, of course, um, it can sort of become a curse. So I'm definitely interested in reading Midas' story. Yes, I have worked with the deck with the guidebook, but I have not read all of the stories, okay? Um, like I said, 250 pages. 
I also struggle a lot with all of these names. Um, it's a little hard for me. I really like the scene here in the in the background. What I think is really interesting here is that we have the keyword talent, but we don't really see him doing anything. So that is something that I would have to look to the guidebook for if I want to interpret the story into the reading. But what I will say is that overall, I like a deck to stand on its own where I don't have to use the guidebook only if I want to. And I do think this is a deck that you can just use the deck and the keyword and it's clear enough and you don't need the guidebook. I do think the guidebook adds something to this deck, but I appreciate that you don't have to use it to understand what the card is trying to tell you. And I personally really appreciate that. That's interesting too. Like I said, I don't know all of these stories by head, um, but I think a lot of the cars already sort of tell a story all by itself. But what I wanted to say is not only do I like a deck to be able to stand on its own, but I also have a lot of trouble when... Okay, that is my dog. I also have a lot of trouble when she keeps dropping her bone <laughs> or she is taking it inside of her crate right now. So... I have a lot of trouble with understanding mostly i've seen it mostly be done with tarot decks where there is an entire story an entire concept or like a story that you sort of have to read through to be able to understand where each card fits in the story now i do not think this is a deck like that like yeah it has stories because every card is all about a person about uh, a hero and here with Orpheus we want to know his story when you pull a card like this especially with a keyword like healing I would love to know Orpheus's story to see how that applies to the question I asked to my reading and then sort of go from there with my tarot cards that is something that I would um, like to do and maybe we are going to do that in the example reading um, if you are not new to my channel you know that I usually don't do my review videos like this but I thought that I wanted to mix up my review I don't want to say it my review style Ooh, of course it, it makes sense that this is spider but I'm already getting I'm already getting goosebumps. Oh, 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 okay. Ooh, I like this. Arrogance. And you can really see that. That is a um ooh, that is a card or a, a thing, a theme that I don't know. I don't know if I necessarily tend to be arrogant. I don't think so, but I have to be careful that my confidence doesn't come across, I think, as arrogance. Uh Penelope, Faith. Ah, we're in the Leo. <laughs> And I am a Leo son, so that makes sense that these keywords, uh, that that the, uh, I, I, I resonate with them. Service, I think that makes sense for uh, the little Virgo sign here as well. So I do like the um, the keywords, the, the scene, the vibe of the card with the astrological symbol. Again, we're definitely going to look into the guidebook to see if it dives deeper into that and if we can really see that zodiac sign like that energy in the story of the card as well odysseus strategy this is a beautiful card like the artwork i think is really pretty i do really like the artwork i like that there is a diversity of sort of ways that everything is depicted like i said the mythos tarot really has uh, like all portraits but here we have actual like sometimes we have scenes and sometimes um, we see it more like this but I do think that this image works with the keyword um, something that I do want to say is all of these um, heroes all of these people here in the cards all look very like beautiful they're all very uh, thin <laughs> let's just say oh psyche interesting but I think for a deck about like these mythic heroes or gods and goddesses I think it makes sense that everybody is beautiful because they are the people that, that they used to put on a pedestal that they see as a god or a goddess so of course they would be depicted in a way that is almost perfect but what I do like about the the greek pantheon is that 
yes, they may look perfect, but through the stories and through everything that they did, you learn that they aren't like their lives weren't perfect. They as a person weren't perfect. I really like this card as well. And I like that they're in a store here um, with like potions and ingredients, plants, all of that. Um, I really like this card. Uh, anyway, what I was saying um, that, yeah, okay, they might might look perfect from the outside, but there is still a lot of trouble on the inside. And that is something that I think a lot of us can uh, can relate to. Here we have Burden, of course, that's the Capricorn. <laughs> that's a Capricorn sign that uh, makes sense. I pulled this card for, I do on my Patreon, I do tarot zines where um, every month I put out a tarot zine with spreads for the full moon of that month, the new moon of that month, as well as the um, astrological season start. So for March, it was April. Uh, they, uh, sorry, for March it was Aries, so the Aries season spread. And I also do a monthly theme and Perseverance was the theme for March based on this card. So I really appreciated this card as well as the um, the little entry in little, it's not really little, entry in the guidebook. This is cool too. Oh, I like friendship for Aquarius. And I like this card overall as well. Perfectionism, Atalanta. That is going to be one that I'm going to want to look up. Like I said, I haven't read the entire guidebook. It's a lot. And um, I've mainly just been working with the deck itself. Uh, I do want to show you like, yes, the cards are a little big. Um, and I do have a lot of mobility issues in my hands, but I don't have any trouble shuffling these cards, reading with these cards, um, working with them. So I think that is really, really nice. Oh, wait, we got the Pisces here. Really, really beautiful card as well. And I think this is a really um, stunning and emo emotional scene. I think it makes a lot of sense for Pisces. And then here we have Pegasus. We have the full moon. Then here, I never know it's if it's the, the waxing or the waning moon. Uh, we have the Sphinx. We, ha we have the new moon. Or maybe that was the, this was the new moon. And this is the full moon. Medusa. That is so interesting. And I love the keyword reflection. Uh, both for Medusa, actually. But also um, for the full moon. I think that makes sense. And then the last one. Sirens for another half moon. Cleanse. I don't know. There's something about sirens and siren energy that I find very um, intriguing. Okay, so I'm going to zoom out and show you how this deck shuffles. So the cards are quite large. This is a card from my Sacred Destiny Oracle. So let's see how it compares. As you can see, it is quite a bit taller as well as a little bit wider than the... like. And I see the Sacred Destiny Oracle as pretty much standard Oracle size. I do know that large cards are a turnoff for some people because they have a lot of trouble shuffling. I will say the cards stock isn't like super thick. It is feels uh, a little plastic, mm, not even that plasticky. It's like shiny cardboardy. Uh, it doesn't, f mm, I don't know. I know nothing about cardstock. I am not Lisa Papaz. So, but for if you um, make a deck of this size, then I think this cardstock makes a lot of sense because you can really work with it. So let me show you how I do the riffle shuffle. Ooh. And it works really, really well. As you can see, um, it really doesn't take a lot of strength for me on the thumbs to shuffle this. And it's just a very, very easy um, riffle shuffle. And I usually only overhand shuffle when I'm really ready to work with the deck. Um, but we're not yet because we are going to go into the guidebook. Now, like I said, um, 250 pages. <laughs> that is a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. So... Let's dive in what we see in the guidebook. As you can see here, the cards are divided by the heroes of Aries, the heroes of Taurus, the heroes of Gemini. Um, it's the funny thing is when I pick when I get a card, I just flip through here to find the card, so I hadn't even taken a look at the table of contents. 
So here we have all of those. We have a foreword as well as a preface. Is that how you say it? A preface, a preface and an introduction. This is more of an introduction to the Oracle deck. There are 40 cards in Oracle of the Mythic Heroes from Greek and Roman mythology. We already saw that. The first 36 cards are assigned to the mythical heroes. Rosie, can you hear my dog bark? What's going on? There's no one. And each one rules a decan of a zodiac sign with its own teaching. That is so interesting. I know a lot of you uh, have been following the decan walk, I think it's called. So that means that there are three cards, as we saw, per zodiac sign. So, and of course, you have the three de um, decans per zodiac sign as well. So that is so interesting. I do not know a lot about, first of all, astrology. <laughs> but also about the decans. So I would love if you could take a look at this and see whether or not you feel like it resonates with the decans. Uh, that would be really, really interesting to hear from you in the comments down below. Altogether, the 36 cars complete a full 360 degree circle on the astrological chart. The last four cards, the four mythical creatures, symbolize the last, the four phases of the lunar cycle and the four transitional seasons of the year. So there's a little bit more information about astrology and uh, how that is integrated in the cards. So that is really, really cool if that is something that you want to um, implement. So they also talk about modalities here. Also included is the element of the zodiac sign and its modality. I think we're going to see that in the guidebook information because I'm not seeing it on the card. Then it has a little blurb on how to build a relationship with the cards, how to work with spreads with this deck. And then it has some spreads, a one card, three card, seven card, the spear that looks really cool. And then we're going to dive into the heroes. So uh, we're not going to flip through the entire book again pretty long. So let's take a look here. We have the first card. Oh, I probably should have, um, <laughs> I probably should have um, taken the first card. Well, let's just grab this card. Uh, we have card number 12. So let's go to number 12. And this is always how I do it in any deck. Um, Althea is Cancer. So we're here. Yes. So we have Althea, I think that's how you say it. The keyword is protection. Uh, we have the a planet of Neptune that is associated with it. Um, it's the third decan of Cancer, and then it shows the decan dates, and then the crystal that is associated with it. Um, moonstone makes sense to be associated with Cancer. I wonder what the other here for Cancer, we have Pluto and then Lapis Lazuli. And here we have the Moon and Emerald with Healing. I, I do like it. I don't know. I feel like I don't know a lot about astrology, but somehow I feel like it makes sense. So here it says, in the third decan of Cancer, we are encountering the last dimension of the cardinal and vigilant form of the water element, which is embodied in the mythological figure of Thea, Althea, queen of Caledon and the loving mother of the hero Naligar and heroine Di... I'm not going to try that. So here it talks about the myth. So this is the story of Althea. And as you can see, we have a lot. And it's not like written as a story where it's like once upon a time, da, da, da. no, it, I feel like it goes sort of straight into it, which is what I appreciate when it comes to a guidebook to a deck like this. So I know that there is the Tarot of the Divine and that one really goes into a sort of a story per card with the additional book that you can buy for, for it. And I think it makes sense if you have like an additional book to sell with it, that it has it as a story format. But I appreciate the way that it is put into the guidebook here. Um, yeah, so we have the entire story there. And then not just that, um, we don't, don't just have the myth, the story, but we also have the teaching. What is it exactly that the story of Althea 
teaches us. So it says here, when the Morai predicted the Malagar's faith, Altia did everything she could to protect her son. Again, we have the keyword protection, so that makes sense. Uh, I really like that. I really like it because you don't have to read all of it. If you just want the teaching, you can just read this. If you want to read the entire story of Althea, you can do it there. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, and that is what you get for every single card. So um, here we have another one. We have a Penelope Leo Faith. So we go to... Let's see, wait, we have uh, Hercules Strength. I like that Hercules is Leo. It does, that makes sense to me. So here we have the third Deccan of Leo uh, with Penelope. Again, a third Deccan uh, card. And here again, we go into the myth of who Penelope was and and we also have the teaching here and like i said you get quite a bit of information for every card and i personally really like that again this you don't have to read all of this to be able to understand this card right but i think if you work with a deck that is created all about mythic heroes then it makes sense that you are going to want to learn the stories maybe not directly during your reading but maybe afterwards then we have about the author you can definitely tell that he has a lot of um, knowledge about astrology i like that and if you want to learn more about the author you can go to thehealingkingdom.com no heroes are perfect, neither are they utterly invincible in myth. They love, they hate, they struggle, they fail, and they rise again together with the cosmic wheel of fortune. I like that. It kind of goes hand in hand with what I already said about the stories not being perfect, the actual like people not being perfect. So... I like that. So let us do an example reading. If we want to know what to focus on for next week, what is something that we need to focus on? Ooh, okay. We are starting with a pregnant person. We have Leto, and this is the Virgo sign, and we have anxiety. Lovely. Well, we got to focus on anxiety. Okay, so let's take a look. What can we learn about this card that has to do with our focus for next week? Okay, the planet that is associated with it is Saturn. That would make me think that maybe this is something to do with work. For me, that makes a lot of sense because I start my new job next week and I do have a little, little bit of anxiety uh, for it. Selenite. This makes me think that I am going to want to bring selenite um, on my first day to work. Okay, so the uh, myth here is, uh, oh, it's, it always starts with sing, O muses of the days before the gods ruled from Mount Olympus. Sing, uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay, Leto moved modestly through the world, always wearing a dark gown and a dark veil. Yet she managed to catch the eye of Zeus. The god of thunder loved her immediately, as he did with so many maidens he set his eyes upon. He pursued her relentlessly, and like many of the women before her, she grew ever more flattered by his adoration. The love between Zeus and Leto bore fruit, and the titaness soon found herself pregnant. But she was not the only one to know. Cesus, the northeast wind who had long loved Leto from afar, witnessed their love and in his rage carried the tale to Zeus's new wife. Hera, the internally jealous goddess of marriage and family, was unable to take vengeance upon Zeus for his infidelity, so instead she chose to curse the Titaness. Leto would never rest easy upon the land, and no solid ground would grant her belief in her time of childbearing. Leto felt the weight of Hera's curse the moment it was uttered. Fear clawed at her throat. Her heart began to raise and she jumped at every sound as her thoughts were assailed by armies of waking nightmares. The Titaness wandered the land, shrinking from every shadow, quaking from every sound. Where would she find safe harbor? Where would she give birth to her children? She could feel them, twins growing in her womb. 
Her fears and anxieties for herself and for them dogged her every step. No place in Greece or any other land offered her rest. She walked forever on, unable to rest for longer than a few moments, as the land beneath them would always throw up thorns and rocks to urge her onward. She grew heavy and great with the child, and the twins within her grew and grew, and yet could not be born because of the curse of Hera prevented it. Please, she cried, please have mercy. She entreated the grasses and trees, but they were rooted in the land and they would not help her. She entreated the birds of the air to drag her aloft that she may deliver her children there. But the birds refused, for they all relied upon the land to support their nests in which they could rear their own young. The Titaness was alone in her misery and anxiety, but Poseidon, the god of oceans, had taken pity on Leto's sister, Asteria, as she fled the unwanted attentions of Zeus, turning her into an island called Delos that floated unmoored from the bottom of the sea. And now he took pity on Leto. He sent Delos to her, and Leto, weeping, took sanctuary on the island that had been her kin. Because Asteria's island was not made of solid ground, it was able to support Leto in the birth of her twins. She brought forth Artemis, the goddess of the moon, who helped Leto in her long labors to bear Apollo, the god of the sun. With her children safe and sound in her arms, Leto felt peace for the first time since she had lain with Zeus. Hera's curse was finally broken. All anxiety fled from Leo and her customary serenity returned. Together with Artemis and Apollo, whose divine presence granted Leto lasting protection from Hera, she took a residence upon Olympus and dwelled there in peace forevermore. Okay, so that was quite a long story. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. But I think that is really pretty and makes sense why she's pregnant. It makes sense why she's on this, um, like she's on an island. So I think the image makes a lot of sense for the story as well. And I really like the idea here without even reading the teaching, we can really get a feeling of, okay, so anxiety is the key word. And the anxiety was brought upon her by a curse, the curse from Hera. But the curse didn't last forever, and with the help of someone else, I mean, she did, you know, trot through, she did go through all uh, of it all, she kept walking, but ultimately she got help from somebody else who was able to do something for her, um, so she could go on and eventually no longer uh, have the anxiety, but instead um, have serenity. So I think that is the teaching here. I don't know if I want to, if I also want to read the teaching because it's quite long. It's all of this. So yeah, I think here we're going to read the last part. I recommended acceptance and commitment therapy for, okay, we don't know who Antonio is. Um, I saw it here. Oh, Antonio was a healthy and fit client in his 50s. Um, let's see. Okay. Your situation will unfold properly, regardless of how it seems in your mind. Trust the infinite and accept that all is well. So focus on the larger and spiritual vision of your life and let the higher power bring the right path forward to you. So I hope you understand what I meant when I said that the guidebook definitely brings value to your readings, to this deck, but you don't have to use it. But when you read it, the card starts making more sense and you can do your interpretation in a little bit of a different way. So this is my final review for the Oracle of Mythic Heroes. I think it is a really cool and fun deck. Obviously, you're going to have to be interested in the Greek pantheon and the stories uh, all of all of that. <laughs> if you don't find that interesting, you're not gonna enjoy this deck unless you're just totally gonna ignore the guidebook. But I think, like I said, the guidebook definitely adds some value and I would definitely recommend you read the story and the teaching of the card you pull. So that is why I recommend that if you get this deck, you start off reading 
with it one card at a time so you can really dive deep into the myth and the message and then once you have yourself familiarized with the stories and the teachings that is when um, it's probably easier to read with multiple cards from this deck so yeah that is what i think about this deck i think the quality is a nice i think the guidebook is really good i don't mind 40 cards in an oracle deck uh, i know some people really want like 50 plus cards in an oracle deck i don't really mind i feel like as long as the cards that are in here are good then i i don't really mind and i do think that that is the case i do think we have 40 cards we have 40 40 stories 40 heroes and i think that that is enough for this deck let me know your thoughts on this deck do you have it uh, do you want it let me know in the comments down below and also i would love to hear how you enjoyed this type of walkthrough review again i have worked with this deck so it's not a first impressions it is a review and later today i am going to record two more walkthroughs so i hope you like this <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you want to see more tarot chats and deck reviews. Take a look at my Patreon if you want to be a part of a guided tarot practice where you get a monthly tarot zine as well as other goodies to help you create a more consistent practice. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye!